Dr. Fizz, Theoretical Physics. Convolution from Power Series. We can gain insight into the convolution by considering an analog with power series. But before we do that, let's remind ourselves what the convolution is. The convolution of the function little f of t with little g of t is given by this integral. Now, when you do a Laplace transform of a convolution, you get a product of Laplace transforms where each of these Laplace transforms correspond to Laplace transforms of the individual functions used in the convolution. So capital F of s is the Laplace transform of little f of t, and capital G of s is the Laplace transform of little g of t. Over here in transform space, we have a standard product of two functions. Over here in the original space, we do not have that. We have instead a convolution. So we're going to look at two power series, and here the analogy is this. The big A and the big B are residing in some kind of transform space relative to the little a's and little b's that live in our regular space. So we're going to multiply the big A with the big B, just like we multiply these two, and then see how the little a's and little b's get related over here on the left-hand side. Or, in a sense, what is the result over here if I were to write this as a power series capital C of x with little c's. How are the little c's related to the little a's and the little b's? That's what we really mean by the relationship of the little ones over here. So let's look at our product and be careful here that you choose a different index in each case because when you go from 0 to infinity over here and 0 to infinity over there. When you multiply these, you have to get all possibilities, like here, index is 6, index over here has to be anything. Could be 8, could be 6, could be 10. So we need to have a different index. So k for the index for the a case and l for the b case. Well, when we do that, we then can multiply x to the k times x to the l and get x to the k plus l. And I want to express this as a new x to some index n so that I can get what the equivalent thing for the c sub n is for the product here. I multiply these two to get a capital C of x, but I want to know how the little c's are related to the little a's and b's. So how do I do that? Well, first of all, note that here when l is 0, L is here on the vertical, K is on the horizontal. When L is 0, K takes on all the values from 0 on out to infinity. Now these are represented by little intersections here, these uh, values. When L is equal to 1, I'm up here, and then I have to get all the Ks. So by looking at these horizontal lines, I cover the entire quadrant. Or I can look at vertical lines and get the entire quadrant covered all possibilities. Say L is 8, K is 7. Now looking at the N variable, which is going to be K plus L here, K plus L is N, then how do I replace that with limits? Well, first of all, let's do the obvious replacement. K plus L is N, and then little l here is N minus K. But then I'm left with n and k, where do they go from? Well, they have to go so that I get all my l's and k's. Now I can get all my l's and k's by the horizontal lines, by the vertical lines, but also by the slanted lines. Slanted lines, a family of slanted lines will give me all the points, all the intersection points. For example, let's consider the case where n equals 0. If n equals 0, I just have this point l equals 0, k equals 0. If n equals 1, then I pick up two points. l is 1, k is 0, k is 1, l is 0. If n is 2, I get the l is 2, k is 0 point, k and l both equal to 1, and then here k is 2 and l is 0. So in that fashion, I get everything. Let's consider n equal to 5. So k plus l equal to 5. Watch what happens to k. k starts off at 0, and that means l is 5. Then when k is 1, l is 4. 
when k is 2, l is 3. When k is 3, l is 2. When k is 4, l is 1. And when k is 5, l is 0. So that gets all the values when n is equal to 5 along this slant. But I'm going to get all the points because so it's going to do all the slants. n is going to go from 0 to infinity. Everything's covered. And k goes from 0 up to n. So that's what we have here. k goes from 0 to n, and then n goes from 0 to infinity. And when we do that, we can get this nice result where we look at the product of capital A, capital B, and that's equal to some capital C of x, and then that must be some little c's times their x's. And here I can do this sum over the k first, k equals 0 to n, and notice that top n defines the c of n, goes with that. Everything in this bracket is the c sub n, and that's a convolution. That is the analog in the discrete form of our continuous convolution. Notice we have a k here and an n minus k. And let's go ahead and make this a continuous case by promoting the discrete variables to continuous variables. We do that by inserting here delta k, because delta k is 1. k goes from 0 to n steps by 1. And then we use our rule to go continuous. We change delta to d. We rip off the indices and promote them here to continuous variables. So this becomes a as a function of k. And the n minus k becomes the argument for the b function. And then I change my summation sign into a snake and have an integral. Well, this is the integral form for the convolution. This is our definition of the convolution. And we can relate this to our normal conventional variables by letting the n equal t, n equal t, and letting k equal u. So k equal u, dk du. And we have our convolution. A formula here arrived at from the discrete case, the convolution, the end.